Good morning and welcome to Deerfield United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Joanna and at Deerfield we are committed to loving Jesus and to loving people. This morning because of the weather conditions we are not meeting in person but I'm so glad that you are watching this with us on Facebook, on YouTube channel or on the church website. Thank you for being with us. We'd love to know that you are here, so put a little comment in the comment section or go to the church website where you can fill in a contact, a digital contact card. A few announcements this morning. Uh, we continue to have sub sandwich tickets available. Tickets are $9. They're redeemable at Franco's Market and you get a sandwich, a drink, and chips and you can buy those tickets either from sherry masters or through the church office this tuesday night the events committee will be meeting so if you're on that committee uh, make sure that uh, that you participate and the email will be sent out with how to connect it's going to be a zoom call and we'll be looking at specifics of Lent and Easter, Palm Sunday, and how we can do those things in this season in a way that allows us to connect with God and to connect with one another. Other announcements are um, the Easter boxes that we have given out in Seabrook community. We're gonna do that again this year. Now, some of you may have picked up a box last year and still have that laying around. We need to know if you have a box that you're going to use or even if you're not going to use it um, we'd like to know so we know how many boxes are out there and if you've not done this before you don't have a box and would like to please let us know we'll make sure that you get one and a list of the foods that we include uh, money is donated then to purchase hams and these are distributed into a community that we have a ministry um, where we have a ministry through Elaine Strang. And uh, just keep praying for Elaine and for that ministry. Her heart for those children and those families is so strong and it's been hard to not be able to meet the way they normally would. We have a few birthdays this week. Uh, Doug Mahaffey and Lynn Mahoney Jr. are having their birthdays on Tuesday and Tom Morris is on Wednesday. We wish you all a very happy birthday. Now let us join together as we worship God through song.
this morning. It's found in 1 Kings 19, verses 3 through 11. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Our New Testament lesson is found in James 5, verses 13 through 18. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. May we add the Lord's blessing to the reading of his word. This past week, I created an informal poll on Facebook, and I asked people to answer this question. What one word describes your emotional state around this pandemic, these last 10 months of this COVID pandemic? If we were together this morning, I would ask you to shout out your answers. I took the answers to that poll on Facebook and made a video of them. And as you watch this video, I want you to pay special attention to any of those words that kind of resonate with you or kind of jump out to you.
words could have been chosen by the prophet Elijah. This morning we heard a portion of Elijah's story and if you want to read more I encourage you to take time this week and read through 1 Kings 18 and 19. In the passage we're looking at this morning we get an intimate look into Elijah's emotions and we discover just how human this prophet of God really is. But let me set the stage for God's question to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? Chapter 18 is the highest point in Elijah's career, followed by chapter 19, where we find him at his lowest point. And isn't that how it often is? We have this great mountaintop spiritual experience only to be followed by a deep fall into a valley. The story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal is one of the more well-known stories in the Bible. One after another of the kings of Israel have turned away from the Lord. And now the worst one, King Ahab, is on the throne and his non-Israelite false God-following wife, Jezebel, is with him. Now, Jezebel's influence is being felt throughout Israel. Not only is she promoting worship of her false gods, of Baal, the storm god, and Ezra, the mother goddess, but she's killing off the prophets of the Lord. Right now, there are only 50 prophets remaining, and they are hiding in a cave for fear of their life. Elijah, however, does not hide at this point. He confronts Ahab and Jezebel for worshiping false gods, and then he challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest. He says, you cry out to Baal, and I will call on the Lord, the God. Whichever one sends fire on a prepared sacrifice will be recognized as the true God. The false prophets agree to this, thinking that their gods will prevail. Elijah turns to the people of Israel and asks them to decide whom they will serve and worship, Baal or the God of Israel. They can't serve both. However, the people are silent. They don't answer. They're content to have one foot in both worlds. They apparently want both Baal and the Lord Yahweh. The prophets of Baal build an altar, placing the sacrificed animal on top, and then they cry out to their God from morning until noon in total futility. They continue and Elijah begins to make fun of them. He says, shout louder, maybe your God has a hearing problem. And so they continue to cry out and cry out to their gods. And Elijah says, well, maybe your God's on vacation or maybe he's sleeping and you need to wake him up. But nothing happens. The prophets only become more desperate they cut themselves in an attempt to appease their deity. Still no response. And after a long time of crying out, they finally give up. Now Elijah builds, builds his fire on 12 stones. These 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He arranges wood and places a sacrifice animal on top. And then... He does this crazy thing, something you don't do when you're building a fire. He orders that the whole thing be doused in water. Three times they soak the altar, the wood, and the sacrifice in water. And then Elijah prays, and fire from heaven comes down, consumes the animal sacrifice, consumes the wood, the altar, all the water is dried up, and even the rocks are consumed, the stones are consumed by the fire. At this, the people, at least temporarily, acknowledge that the Lord, Yahweh, is the one true God. Elijah then orders that all the prophets of Baal be killed as God's punishment on them for leading the people of Israel astray. Finally, Elijah announces to Ahab that the three-year drought will come to an end. After testing their faith a little bit longer, the Lord opens the skies and brings a much-needed heavy rain. After such an incredible spiritual victory with an overwhelming display of God's power, one might think that Elijah would be on the top of the world, that the Israelites would return to the one true God, carrying Elijah on their shoulders as, their prof as his prophet. 
but that's not the case. And, and it's actually quite the opposite, in fact. Elijah expected revival and a mass return to worshiping the one true God, and that didn't happen. Jezebel is furious, and she declares that within 24 hours, what was done to her prophets will be done to Elijah. The once strong, confident, empowered by God, spirit-led prophet Elijah is now afraid and runs for his life. He runs and runs and runs. And coming upon Beersheba in Judah, he leaves his companion there and he continues on running for yet another day's journey into the wilderness. Finally, he comes upon a broom tree. Now, the great thing about broom trees is that their branches grow out straight out and wide and it creates this space, this large space of shade. Elijah is exhausted and he all but collapses underneath that tree. The day before, he prayed before the crowds, declaring who God was, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, the one true God. Now alone, he prays a prayer of desperation. He prays a prayer that perhaps some of us have prayed at some point in our lives. He says, enough, enough, I'm done. Take my life, I'm worthless. I'm no better than those who have gone before me. I'm done. And in utter desperation, he falls asleep. Now notice here, God doesn't reprimand Elijah. He doesn't yell at him and draw him into some deep theological discussion or tell him life is hard, pull yourself together and get over it. What does he do? He lets Elijah sleep. He lets Elijah take a nap. Elijah has been through a very rigorous, vigorous, intense period physically. Everything that, just has, that has just happened has taken such a toll on him. Physical fatigue can make us prone to depression and thoughts of despair. Even mountaintop experiences can deplete our emotional reserves. Anyone feeling like their emotional reserves are depleted? Crying out, enough, I'm done. And it's not just that. Elijah had unfulfilled expectations and hopes. He was expecting revival, and instead he finds himself running away in fear. Disappointment, broken dreams, unfulfilled expectations take their toll on our body, mind, and spirit. These last 10 months have been full of them. With our disappointment comes discouragement and even depression, and that is physically exhausting. After resting for a while, we read that an angel touches him and tells him to get up and eat. I love this. The Lord doesn't jump all over him. He doesn't say, oh good, you're up. Now we're gonna talk about this prayer of yours, of, of yours earlier. He doesn't correct Elijah. He's not mad at him. Instead, we see two things. First, the angel touched him. I'm sure the angel didn't need to touch him to wake him up, but Elijah was alone. He was intentionally alone. He had isolated himself. He left his servant a day ago and is all alone in the wilderness. Elijah's isolated, alone, not just physically, but so many of his friends, his prophet friends, have been killed. He is deeply lonely and grieving. Can you relate? Have you missed human touch? during this pandemic, the hug of a friend, a grandchild, a tender touch on the arm just to let you know that you're not alone. Most of the time, we can't even see each other's smiles behind the masks. And especially for those who live alone or are forced to be alone because of uh, quarantine, we miss that touch. And so in a time when Elijah was at his lowest, the Lord sends an angel to wake him with a touch, to let him know he's not alone. 
When praying for people, I often ask God to make his presence real, tangible for them. I believe God wants to let us know that he is right there with us in our darkest time, putting an arm around our shoulder, wiping away our tear, a tear. God cares and he meets us right where we are at. Elijah wakes and he looks around and right by his head lays a fresh baked, still warm out of the oven loaf of bread and some water. There's a Snickers commercial that I love with Betty White and she's playing football and she's playing poorly and the team is complaining about how she's not up to speed and how she's playing so poorly and someone rushes in off the sidelines and hands her a Snickers bar and she takes a bite and suddenly she transforms into this guy named Mike. Fade to black and a voice says, you're not you when you're hungry, Snickers satisfies. As important as rest is to our body, a good night's sleep, a solid nap, feeding our body is important too. When sleep and eating are out of whack, we're prone to feeling off to our emotions and thoughts getting, our thoughts getting at the best of us. The God who created us, who made our bodies the way they are, knows this. And so he cares for Elijah in this very practical way. And he says to us, pay attention to these signs. Do you need rest or sleep? Are you eating well? How beautifully God ministered to Elijah, not to just his soul, but his body. And then he lets him take another nap. Nap, eat a good meal, nap again. That actually sounds like my plans for this afternoon. <laughs> so the angel of the Lord comes back touches him again and again instructs him to eat. Now refreshed physically, he's given new instructions. That must have been quite a meal that he had because it strengthened him for a 40 day journey to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And then when he gets there, he climbs up a bit and then spends the night in a cave, more sleep. <laughs> A little interesting fact that plays into this is that Mount Horeb is also known by the name Mount Sinai. And according to theologians, it's believed that Elijah was possibly in the same place that Moses was after 40 years in the wilderness when he went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And while he was there, he asked the Lord to show him his glory. And the Lord instructed him to hide in the, in the crook of a, uh, the mountain. And then the Lord would pass by. And at that point, Moses looked and he saw the back of the Lord. So it's quite possible that Elijah is in that same place hiding when the word of the Lord, the spoken voice of God comes to him and asks the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? God wasn't asking for his to-do list for the day or his geography. He was asking a much deeper question. One, he asked us, what's going on with you, Elijah? Tell me what's on your heart. What's happening here? Now, we can't hear the tone of voice in the written word, but in my head, this is what Elijah's response sounded like. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They torn down your altars and they put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. How does God respond? Does he address what Elijah just said? Does he call him on the condition of his heart, his emotions, his wrong thinking or beliefs, or tell him to stop whining? No, instead he tells him to stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord himself is about to pass by. He calls Elijah to come out of the cave, to come out of hiding and stand in God's presence. And so we read that a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart, shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then there was an earthquake, 
but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then there was fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Elijah himself had seen God powerfully reveal himself through fire just a few days ago, but not in this case. But then came something completely different, a gentle whisper. Elijah knew immediately that the Lord was in the whisper because he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The whisper asked him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? At which he responded the same. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. We don't know, but I wonder if he spoke these words as a changed man changed by his encounter with God, spoken more as one would report on the events that had just happened and less like the whines of a wounded spirit. Because at this, the Lord gives him renewed purpose. Remember at the beginning of the story, Elijah wanted to give up and die. He felt useless and purposeless. And now God sends him back to Damascus gives him authority to anoint not just one, but two kings of Israel. And he gives him a companion, a, a man named Elisha, to mentor and train as his successor. Now, I took some time with this story because I think it's important to see the full scale of emotions and the journey physically, emotionally, and mentally that Elijah went through with God and to see how God showed up in each phase. This is how God shows up for us. He's not put off by our frustrations or our fear. He's not surprised or angry when we give in to times of despair or depression. He doesn't tell us to get over it and push through. This story gives us a picture of a God who tenderly shows up in all those moments and meets us exactly where we are. He addresses our physical needs for rest and food. Are you tired and physically feeling off? I encourage you to give thought to how you could build rest and healthy living habits into your life. Invite God to show you where and how. It's a spiritual discipline and a way that God ministers to our body and to our soul. In the midst of his despair, God leads Elijah on a 40 day journey from the broom tree to Mount Horeb. God invites him on a journey back to where it all began, where God appeared to Moses and first appeared to the nation of Israel at the sealing of the covenant. Perhaps we too need a journey back to our spiritual roots, back to the basics of our faith to rekindle our own spiritual fire or be refreshed or reconnect with God, the God of the covenant, the God who called us, and the God who cares for us. That is, after all, what Lent is about, a time set apart to refresh, renew, rekindle, and reconnect. During the 40 days of Lent, we'll be offering the opportunity to read through the Gospel of John. Returning to the Gospels has a way of centering us and reminding us who God is and what our faith is all about. I encourage you to consider committing to these daily readings. God invited Elijah as well to put his feelings of despair into words. He does this through his question to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? There is something very healing about putting words to our feelings, to admitting to what's going on inside. In this, pandem this pandemic, God is asking us, what are you doing here? It's an invitation, an invitation to reflection, to assess how we're doing, what we're feeling, to look at our relationships with God and with others and allow him to lead, to, to lead and guide us through them. David models this for us in the Psalms. As you read through the Psalms, you see a man who is very honest with God about how he feels 
And as he gets it all out, he returns to this. I fix my eyes on God, my God and my Lord. Might I encourage you to carve away some time in the next week or so, sit with a pen and paper, even just a few minutes. Tell God what's going on inside of you. Release those pent up feelings and trust him to lovingly receive what you share and minister to you in the midst of it. So God meets his physical needs. He invites him to vent and to open up before him. And we see then God revealing himself to Elijah in a new and intimate way. God doesn't appear through the powerful wind, through the earthquake or through the consuming fire in this situation. Instead, he reveals himself to Elijah in a quiet whisper. And it's in that whisper that he draws Elijah out of hiding and into the open, into his presence. And that's when he asks the question again, what are you doing here, Elijah? God is showing Elijah and us that he has the power to shake the earth. His presence does not depend on the dramatic displays of power like Elijah saw with the sacrifice. Sometimes it's in those quiet, intimate moments in silence that his presence whispers into our souls and breathes the deepest healing and love and hope. Of all the spiritual disciplines, silence is my least favorite. If I had to list them in an order, it's even lower on the list than fasting, and I love to eat. Yet we see in this story and in other places in scripture that blocking out the noise and listening quietly to God, to his still small voice, is crucial to growing in intimacy with him. How can you, how can I cultivate times of quiet listening to the Lord in our lives? Perhaps we turn off the TV an hour earlier, listen to less news, Maybe turn the phone off for 15 minutes and just sit quietly inviting God to speak. I don't know what that will be for you, but I know that God will meet you there. The next lesson in Elijah's story is, has to do with renewed purpose. Elijah was done. He felt like a complete failure, failure and was ready to toss in the towel. Yet after being ministered to by God, processing his thoughts, reconnecting and cultivating intimacy with his heavenly father, God gives him a new assignment. He wasn't washed up and useless. God still had a job for him to do. It's good to take a break, especially when we are burned out and weary, but God doesn't leave it right there. Restoration comes when there is a new passion and focus. When we're feeling down and begin to spiral, one of the best things that we can do is look up and serve someone else. Finding, that, finding something that gives life to others and in return gives life to us, breathes life into us and renewed vision and focus. Find a way to volunteer, help someone out, call someone, pray with someone, be a listening ear for what they're going through, maybe run errands for them. God has a purpose for you. And perhaps as you listen to that quiet whisper, you'll be able to hear just what that is in this season of life. Finally, God hears Elijah's cry, his cry of feeling desperately alone, and he brings a companion, a person to work alongside him for whom Elijah can mentor. God created us for relationship, for community. And even in this pandemic, where we're not able to meet together as we would, when we're not able to go out to restaurants together and to connect, there are still ways that we can be together. For some, it's writing cards. For others, it's making phone calls or technology. Technology has allowed me to watch a movie with a friend while we're in, in different states. Ask God to show you who and how you can reach out and perhaps in doing so, you may be answering someone else's prayer of loneliness. Now, as I end this message, I want to say that depression comes in many degrees and has different causes. 
If you or a loved one is experiencing a deep depression, prolonged feelings of despair and hopelessness, counseling and or medical attention may be required. Depression is a deeply complex issue. If this is your situation, I encourage you to reach out for help. Your church family and God loves you and wants to journey with you to a place of healing and hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Elijah. We thank you, Lord, for how you met him in such practical ways, from the pit of despair to renewed vision and focus and purpose. Lord, I ask that you would reach out and meet each one of us where we are. Father, if, if we're in a place where we're doing great with you and our intimacy is being cultivated, then show us how we can reach out to others coming alongside them. Father, I thank you that you are a God of great compassion and that you bring life and hope in the dark places. Lord, shine your light and let us be your light in this world. Amen.